So good evening, everybody. Welcome back to the lecture series Cultures of Images in the Digital Era, Practices, Aesthetics, Genres. I can't believe that it's already the last lecture in 2020 and only five more to come. So it went very quick. Um, tonight, I have the great honor to welcome André Guntert in my lecture series. Bonsoir et bienvenue, André. Bonsoir. It's a pleasure. Um, before I introduce uh, André, let me just quickly repeat that we ask you to keep your cameras and microphones switched off during the lecture. And uh, Marie will share our information on the discussion in the chat, so I don't have to repeat this. Thank you. Yeah, it's a great pleasure that uh, I will now introduce my guest lecturer tonight, André Guntert. He's a professor for Histoire Visuelle, Visual History, at the École des Eaux d'Études en Sciences Sociales in Paris. He is a, a seminal and prolific historian of art and visual culture, and since many years specialized in the field of photography. He has investigated the beginnings of photography, instant photography, photojournalism and the illustrated press, as well as comics. His recent work focuses on the digital image, its history and social uses, as well as the theory of narrating with images. He's the author of two extremely influential and widely received books. The first one is L'Art de la Photographie des Origines de nos Jours, published with Michel Poivert in 2007, an encompassing history of photography and standard reference. This book won the prize of the Académie des Beaux-Arts and has been translated in Italian, Spanish, and Chinese. A second edition was published in 2016. And then, of course, L'Image Partagée, La Photographie Numérique, published in 2015, translated into Italian and German, lucky us. <laughs> uh, the German title is Das Geteilte Bild. Many of you probably know this book. It's a collection of essays on um, cultures of images in the digital era. André Guntert has, as an historian of photography, observed and analyzed the transition of the medium in the digital era very closely and from the beginning on. His research on new image practices in the social web has been pioneering work and very influential in the field, also for my own writing. He has coined and conceptualized terms like the shared image, the conversational image, and the fluid image, and has written on all the crucial topics connected with contemporary image practices like selfies, um, citizen journalism, the figure of the amateur, copyright, war photography, the culture of sharing, the visual economy, videos of police violence, and more. André is the founder of the renowned journal Etude Photographique that existed from 1996 to 2017 and was edited by the Société Française de Photographie, a society that goes back to the mid-19th century. He is currently a visiting fellow at the DFK in Paris, that is the um, Deutsches Forum für Kunstgeschichte, Centre Allemand de Histoire de l'Art. I also want to recommend, warmly recommend André's website with the title L'Image Sociale that he calls a research logbook, um, Le Carnet de Recherche. He is running this logbook since 2014 as a public extension of his research seminars. It is very instructive and significant to the current situation in France and beyond. The most recent posts and images are dealing with um, videos of police violence, a very controversial practice and topic because there's a huge debate about this going on in France at the moment. So this is also um, a great quality of your work, André. It is, at a, uh, it is a critical guidance for contemporary image cultures and an extremely relevant research in the contemporary moment. So we are very much looking forward to hear your talk on counter information videos and discuss with you. André, again, a very warm welcome. 
and thanks for being here and the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kirsten. Thank you very much for your invitation. I'm, I'm very happy to, to be part of, of this conference series and uh, also very honored and, uh, and also a little bit stressed because um, our new way to, to talk uh, through Zoom is uh, I, I'm, I'm not quite acquainted to, so I'm, um, I will try to do my best, but uh, I, I do my excuse for um, if, if something goes wrong. Uh, so I try to show my PowerPoint. Uh, I hope you see. I hope you see the picture. Yeah, it's because fine. I don't have um, the feedback, so I, I don't know what you are seeing. <laughs> so if, yeah, if but the presentation looks good, André. It's good. You. Thanks. Since the revolutions of the Arab Spring uh, in 2011, the idea has taken hold that digital technologies, smartphones and social media could be used to spread the message of protest movements autonomously and that activist communication could make up for the inadequacies of media coverage. In France, the Gilets Jaunes crisis, uh, so yellow vest, I will say Gilets Jaunes, appeared uh, to confirm this theory. In 2020, so this year, the documentary uh, by the independent journalist David Dufresne, The Monopoly of Violence, in French, Un pays qui se tient sage, uh, uh, compiled and comment on 55 of these videos recorded during demonstrations by participants, witnesses, or professional journalists. The sequences are presented as direct testimonies. To the audience, most of them are recognizable from having been shared across social media and sometimes picked up by the television news and thus some of the most discussed images of the crisis. The issue of the access of subalterns or counterpublics to, to take the expression of Nancy Fraser to recognition is one of the great questions of social sciences. Do these new types of image by virtue of their autonomous production and distribution provide a privileged pathway to this recognition, the growing number of examples seems to confirm it. By examine, examine, examining the conditions in which videos depicting violence gain visibility during the Gilets Jaunes crisis, it is possible to test this hypothesis and to clarify some of the questions. It's what I will try to do. While it seems and then undeniable that the new media have the power to raise an alert, it is necessary to revise its causes. It is essential to correct the technicist's approach, which describes the properties of the medium as the key to the process. The viral selection, the principal tool for increasing visibility, depends for the most part on the conflictual and narrative dynamics of public debate. It is therefore essential to focus on content and its reception in order to identify the, condi the conditions which allow online videos to become a powerful means to gain recognition. Released in 2019, Lajli's film Les Miserables was inspired by events in 2015 when following a spate of terrorist attacks, the French government declared a state of emergency granting extensive police powers. The film includes several pieces of footage showing police actions from the locals' point of view in the context described by Steve Mann as surveillance or reverse surveillance, whereby citizens use digital technology against the police. 
surveillance practice took place in the United States in the early 90s in the forms of cop watching, whereby police. Oops. whether police abuses during arrests or control operations in public areas were not only recorded, but also shared publicly. The video of the beating of Rodney King in uh, 1991, recorded, um, uh, broadcast by the following day uh, as breaking news on CNN, was followed in April uh, 92 by a week of riots in Los Angeles after the equipment of accused officers. The use of cop watching in a work of fiction underlines how widespread the practice has become. In order to portray typical aspects of daily life in these areas, Ladge Lee not only shows reverse surveillance to be a reflex reaction of minorities facing police harassment, but also use, uses it as a major dramatic element in a narrative of confrontation with the police. In this context, what is striking is the essentially symbolic character of the use of surveillance. The recording are never shared online in the film and only represent a virtual threat. The characters in the story share the belief in the power of images, the locals film and the police agents fear being filmed, underlining a founding principle of surveillance in the context of a power symmetry, images are supposed to redress the balance of power in, fa in favor of ordinary citizens. Yet, in Les Miserables, this remains theoretical. The threat of power being rebalanced moves the plot forward but has no real consequence for the perpetrators of violence. This mythological role of video in Les Miserables illustrates a stereotypical view of the medium as evidence, which is inherent to the narrative of surveillance. In the case of police violence, where officers usually seek to cover up their actions, the existence of evidence a surveillance video or a smartphone recording can decisively alter an investigate or change an investigation. When events are not recorded, confusion reigns over the alleged circumstances and the responsibility of those involved. During an investigation, surveillance often serves a useful purpose. However, Neither the existence of a video in itself, nor even sharing it online, are sufficient of their own to trigger an alert process. And within the mass of audiovisual evidence shared on social media as a part of the Gilets Jaunes movement, only a few dozen clips emerge from the online selection process to go viral. In order to move beyond the merely technical di dimension of surveillance and analyze the social impact of videos, it is necessary to consider the social alert process as described by Francis Chateaurineau. Indeed, alerts constitute a parallel communication system that is activated under and determined by a specific set of conditions. First and foremost, the alert intervenes in a deficient system whose corrective mechanism didn't succeed. The primary objective of an alert is to expose publicly an information that has been kept hidden in order to generate external pressure. The existence of a risk or danger to the community confers a strong moral legitimacy on the action undertaken, regardless of the possible regularity of the means employed. In January 2019, Liberation published an analysis of the media coverage of the Gilets Jaunes movement, comparing, on one hand, journalistic reporting presumed to be objective with direct communication by activists 
in Facebook groups described as self-referential uh, self babble. Pitting these two opposing narratives overlooks the phenomenon of alerting, whereby messages from a variety of sources are widely disseminated through social media to the general public. One of the best known videos of the Gilets Jaunes crisis showing the arrest of Mont La Jolie high school students forced to kneel on December 2018 was recorded and posted online by a police officer entirely outside of the movement's own communication. So alerts are distinct, both from journalistic coverage and activist communication. It's a third way of mediation. Alerts and news media draw their credibility from contradictory principles. Instead of a neutral observation establishing the objectivity of the message, the value of an alert comes from the source very role of participant on the ground. Without the guarantee that comes with the media brand, whistleblowers have to provide indisputable evidence to back up their reports. Information is also made freely avail available in order to maximize its dissemination. By allowing the public to produce and publish, and publish messages, in, uh, the internet is evidently conducive to the alert process. Moreover, its mythology upholds the idea of direct communication with even the most inaccessible figures. The video addressed to Mr. Macron and his government by Jacqueline Moreau, published in October 2018, became the first viral hit of the Gilets Jaunes movement, precisely because it was a direct message in the protest of an anonymous woman who looked her government in the eye. The video was the embodiment of the face-to-face -face encounter that the Gilets Jaunes were looking for. Similarly, the journalist David Dufresne's Twitter compilation of injuries is entitled Hello Plus Beauvau, I'd like to make a report, where Plus Beauvau is the name of France Interior Ministry. Beginning on December 4, uh, 2018, David Dufresne's series of reports systematically records images documenting violence most often in the form of photographs or video posted on social media by the victims themselves or by direct witnesses. In the alert process, the recorded image constitutes the evidence that triggers the report. The use of images changed the nature of the message, transforming the expression of a personal opinion into a vector of objective information. Audiovisual recording enjoy a strong a priori assumption of authenticity. However, since 2016, social networks have attracted suspicion because of the large amount of fake news that they spread and most internet users cannot easily determine the accuracy of a message. Yet, despite of it, the most shared content come directly from videos on the ground. The credibility of such material is deduced pragmatically using a set of contextual criteria. Signs of proximity um, to the events rather than an identifying byline act as a guarantee. The next step is the analysis of footage which situates the source within events and testified his participation. Finally, content is subject, is subject to test by debate. In a context of polemical exchange, messages are scrutinized by both sides in a process that quickly weeds out the most debatable content. In a short space of time, content that was stood up to criticism from internet users will be considered as de facto validated. The principal measure of, it, of this validation is the reposting of the message. Since social networks make it possible to see the repeated mention of a source, the level of a message virality can be deduced by the number of different users sharing it and the accelerating rate at which it is reposted. 
The term virality refers not to a medium, but to a state of the medium, the increased circulation of content resulting from a rapidly growing participatory selection process. Internet users know a message is going viral when it is repeated by a number of different users in a short space of time. As the algorithm increases circulation in proportion to the number of interactions, likes, reports, comments, content can quickly reach a large number of views from a few thousand to several million in the most successful cases. So minority groups use virality to gain a level of exposure similar to major media outlets. This process is now commonly scrutinized by the press during public debates. Virality thus grants the anonymous a voice and access to greater media coverage. So, to resume, the primacy of the actor of the mediator, direct access to the source, the researcher who takes on the ta task of remediation, the internet fosters the conditions of what J. David Bolter and Richard Grusin called immediacy, a direct communication devoid of intermediation. And in, on the internet, the signs of immediacy function as the equivalent of signs of authenticity. From this perspective, the formal imperfections inherent to an improvised shot, such, such as a shaky or poorly framed image, are not considered as defects, but as confirmations that the material had the precious quality of being directly from the ground. The strengths of this alternative format and the credibility it enjoys are reflecting by the fact, oh, sorry, are reflecting by the fact that some of the press agencies involved in covering the Gilets Jaunes movement abandoned the traditional distribution channels and did choose to share raw footage freely on social networks, short unedited clip with live audio. And as a journalist, uh, David Dufresne has adopted a similar approach by reposting his documentation of police violence on Twitter. By playing the game of viral circulation and accepting the constraints of unfair unfiltered presentation, this journalist bear, bear witness to the shift in a landscape where alerts replace mediation. Broadcast live on Facebook on, on May 2020, the video of the murder of George Floyd by police officers in Minneapolis met with an overwhelming emotional response as several months of demonstration riots and debates over racist violence in the USA and around the world followed. But the spectacle of a black man in excruci excruciating agony also provoked a moral critique of the use of images. In a New York Times article entitled, Please Stop Showing the Video of George Floyd's Death, uh, Melanie Price, a professor of political science, deplored the news channels and internet users endlessly showing brutal image which called to mind the public lynching of black people in the USA. Although well-intentioned, thus such a request is nonetheless paradoxical. Indeed, the representations of violence in mass media is generally avoided or downplayed. Showing violence creates thus a deliberate contrast with this moderating process, suggesting by itself a difference in nature and a shift to a regime of truth through the revelation of hidden facts. The exposure of violence is not only the objective reproductions of the events to be denounced, it is a character constitutive of the alert through the change of regime and the urgency it imposes, through the increased attention it raises and because exceptional brutality signals a dysfunction. 
it must be understood as a weapon in the service of the alert, the catalyst that establishes the need to sound the alarm and defines the framework in which it is to be read, the proof of the gravity of a problem and a tool for taking the public to task. Yet, in reality, uh, okay, that's an, okay, I, I will maybe take the time to come back to this picture afterwards. Though deployed in the alert process, the exposure of violence is nonetheless carefully measured and controlled, and more particularly narrativized. The debates around videos like the Toulouse clip that you're seeing here uh, do not uh, so much seek to determine whether or not a violent act has occurred, but rather examine the justification for the act or the role of its perpetrator. Although the police officer's action is insignificant on the spectrum of brutality, the clip exposes a malevolent and unjust act that in no way serves to maintain order. Police violence is thus far from an objective phenomenon that can be easily identified simply by examining images. On the contrary, images are interpreted through a filter of contradictory rationalizations, which can completely change the ways in which they are read in at least three respects. While the expression police violence suggests a systemic problem, authorities consistently respond by describing the alleged incidents as isolated acts, excesses that will be investigated. Testimony can also be countered by legitimizing brutal acts as a proportionate response necessary to maintain order. Online discussions about videos of misconduct often call for the action depicted, depicted to be contextualized within a broader sequence of events in order to give them a new interpretation. Finally, there is a wide gulf in the percep perception of policing which a survey published in January uh, 2020 showed to be largely correlated with political opinion. 68% uh, of those on the right and supporters of President Macron party believed that law enforcement had not used excessive force, while 62% of those on the left believed the opposite. The sample population is thus split into two roughly equal parts. Presented with the same image, people can therefore have conflicting views on how the violence should be interpreted or even the very necessity of using force. These unstable interpretative frameworks were evident in the case of footage filmed in mont la jolie in December uh, 2018 at the beginning of the Gilets Jaunes crisis, showing police detaining uh, 150 high school students forced to kneel with their hands on their heads. One officer filmed the scene and shared it on social media as a trophy celebrating the victory of the rule of law. The emotional reaction to the video contradicted Melanie Price's view that the display of violence necessarily make the viewers share the perpetrator's point of view. On the contrary, the humiliation suffered by the students in mont jolie aroused anger and indignation. While these feelings were shared only by, more by the more progressive members of the public, such a, such a reception demonstrates that the manner in which images are interpreted is determined not, not so much by depiction of the events, as by the scenario that the viewer projects onto them. Also, it was shared by the perpetrator of the violence. The video from mont la jolie was read mostly as an alert and a denunciation of misconduct. The mont la jolie episode serves to underline 
that the signs of conflict are interpreted independently upon reception by the viewer. Autonomous readings of the movement were encouraged by both the Gilets jaunes movement refusal to designate spokespersons and the mainstream media's difficulty in conveying what was happening on the ground. The theme of police violence, which appeared as early as December 2018 in radical left-wing media, did not cross over from activist communication, largely unnoticed by the general public. Rather, the issue come to fall chiefly because each demonstration brought evidence of the excessive use of force, namely in the aggressive use of blast balls and repeated images of wounded people. The evidence of such violence has itself created a de facto alert process which gradually came to, sur to be sur imposed on the political and social demands of the Gilets jaunes. Viral images are not so much objective documents as narrative in the making. Social constructs forge in real time through discussions on social networks. The lively debate uh, around the footage of Farida's uh, arrest on the evening of June uh, 16, 2020 in Paris lays bare the narrative mechanism behind the ways in which such material is read. After the first post-lockdown demonstration by healthcare workers, uh, there was clear anger in, on in online conversations at the violent repression of the protester as typically indiscriminate policing served only to stir up tensions. A first recording from the scene uh, catches viewers' attention with the clearly audible cry of a healthcare worker in white lab coat being manhandled by several police officers. I want my Ventoline, Vidushin. This narrative key echoed the terrible plea I can breathe from the footage of George Floyd from a month earlier, linking the videos within the pattern of police violence. The effect is reinforced by other signs, such as the asymmetry of the confrontation between an isolated woman and the indistinct mass of agents crowded around her body. The distressing image of macho policing were reinforced at 6.30 p.m. by a tweet commenting on the video, this woman is my mother, 50 years old, a nurse, for three months, she, was worked, she had worked between 12 and 14 hours a day. She's had COVID. Today, she was demonstrating for a pay rise for her work to be recognized. She's asthmatic. She had her lab coat on. She's five foot one. Identifying the nurse and explaining her peaceful presence, there helps to, re to reinforce the storyline. When footage taken from Remy Buzin, live uh, reporting was shared at 6.50, uh, giving a clear version of the altercation, it had already taken on an allegorical value in its portrayal of a symbol of martyrdom, a victim of patently unjust and disproportionate violence by the force of law. A photograph by Antoine Guibert provided an emblematic summary of the scene, gaining further exposure still and giving rise to extensive commentary. In the words of the journalist Diane Daniel Schneiderman, the revolt of the healthcare has found its icon. But later that evening, the police react by sharing a new footage filmed a few minutes before the arrest, showing the nurse raising her middle finger at the police and throwing rubble in their directions. Denials followed lies as numerous tweets questioned the nurse status or accused her of political activism. Her brutal arrest was perfectly justified in the eyes of the supporter of repression, who thereby reversed the dominant narrative of the whole Gilets jaune movement. She could not be considered a victim, on the contrary, her actions showed her to be a culprit. 
What comes across clearly in this exchange of arguments is how interpreting cues according to pre-established roles leads to a stereotyped reading of the scene. Supporters of the healthcare workers looking for clear evidence of police misconduct settled on a video that brought together all the features of a victim figure. In the online discussions that acts as the selection process, which each side's arguments subject to the reaction of its adversary, the footage should have been rejected because of the fact, because of the fact that the arrest was justified by the nurse's reprehensive acts made it vulnerable to criticism. However, the speed which uh, supporters relied around the figure of Farida and the unique nature of the protest by healthcare workers who were seen as heroes set the construction of the narrative on a different course. In an ex unexpected twist, new arguments were produced in support of Farida, laying out the reasons for the healthcare workers' anger or emphasizing that the police do not possess punitive powers on, uh, and that corporal punishment is not a part of the arsenal of law enforcement. Um, indeed, in a reversal of the interpretation of the events, Farida was even transformed from victim into Harry. This allegorization is only possible when footage is very easy to read when both the action and the motivations of those involved are easy to understand. This is part of the selection criteria for viral videos. A decisive factor is the combination of a short video and a plot offering some sort of closure, which allow the footage to be used as a standalone message, which no need to for external reference or additional information, which is crucial if an extract is to be replayed and thus become viral. As such, in the case of short clips that are not necessarily easy to understand, the possibility offered by online platforms to rewatch the footage at will is crucial, especially when the debate requires the careful, careful examination of details that may alter the viewer's interpretation. Another aspect of the social construction of the narrative of police violence is the long-term repetition of acts of violence, which together form a story. Despite the, 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 repeat, the, repeat, the repeated denials of the highest ranking officials of state, the mass of evidence that had built up ultimately lays bare the reality of the systemic nature of police brutality. This underlines the value of David Dufresne's work cataloging the evidence as he is the only French journalist to have furnished the question of police violence with an historical perspective. His videos and numerous appearance in the public sphere from uh, January 2019 onward have helped to construct a narrative around police violence, which over the course of the year evolve from an alert to a counter narrative. If we consider social narratives as way as ways of organizing the collective imaginary, a counter narrative could be described as a minority idea that has become an identifiable motive and part of the conversation in the public sphere. This is indeed the case with the theme of police violence, which was largely absent from French public debate before coming to the fore during the Gilets Jaunes crisis in January uh, 2019. While a poll conducted in 2016 during demonstrations against reform to the labor law showed only 21% uh, of French people considered the use of force by the police to be excessive, this figure rose to 44% in January 2020. Such widespread condemnation from nearly half of the population is unprecedented. A study of the reporting of the Gilets jaunes crisis in the mainstream media confirms that the issue was unreported in this December 2018 before slowly gaining prominence throughout the whole uh, 2019. This, therefore, constitutes a documented case of a minority opinion being transformed into a majority opinion. The political decision to repress the demonstration and the unusually long-running conflict 
have, despite media and political resistance, seen the question of police violence emerge as a major example of a counter narrative resulting from an alert process primarily based on viral images. Often analyzed through a media prism, online communication presents us with opportunistic behavior and emerging uses shaped by circumstance. The alert process and the viral phenomenon that powers it, it, that powers it are prime examples of emerging practice. The alert was raised over police violence in France under specific conditions. The enigma presented by the Gilets Jaunes and the unprecedented social movement attracted widespread public attention. In this context, the inability of the mainstream media to relay was, uh, what was happening on the ground and the disconnect with direct communication available on social media prompted part of the public to change its information gathering behavior. Outside of any analytical framework, the proliferation of audiovisual testimonies of police violence has created a process with its own rules of validation and dissemination driven by the ongoing confrontation over the crisis. While the emergence of this social narrative is the result of exceptional circumstances, it is not due to hazard. Behind the management of the Gilets Jaunes crisis, an historical evolution is playing out in social democracy, which in the face of growing political impotence is giving up ground to the temptations of illiberalism. Last month, within the debate of the global security law, which aims to avoid the identification of police officers on online videos, the reporter for the law, Jean-Michel Fauverg, admits, admits publicly, I quote, let us be clear, the authority and the state in particular is looting the war of images. By the end of the same month, the law repressing the video was adopted by uh, French Assemblée Nationale. Thank you for your attention.